Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 237 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Thanks in large part to the work of a West Virginia woman named Anna Jarvis, the second Sunday in May, Mother's Day, became a national holiday in the United States on May 9, 1914. Now, the purpose of this holiday is so Americans can officially honor all the work that mothers do to raise children. But what precisely is the work that mothers do to raise children? Has the nature of mothers, motherhood, and the work they do changed over time? Nora Doyle, an assistant professor of history at Salem College in North Carolina, has combed through the historical record to find answers to these questions. Specifically, she sought to better understand the lived and imagined experiences of mothers and motherhood between the 1750s and 1850s. Now, using details from her book, Maternal Bodies, Redefining Motherhood in Early America, Nora reveals... How early Americans thought about mothers and motherhood between the 1750s and 1850s. How early American women experienced pregnancy and childbirth. And the legacies and impact early American views of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood have had on our own present-day views of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood. But first, I do want to wish all mothers a very happy Mother's Day, especially my own mother. Mom, thank you for encouraging my interests and for that book allowance. It always fed my insatiable curiosity, and I'm still reading today because of it. Thank you for raising me to be independent and self-sufficient. And thank you for that formative example you set on how to be a good, honest person. I know we talked about me following you into medicine for years, and that didn't happen. But the respect and care you've always provided others has set the real example for how I try to approach history in the historical record, with a lot of diligence, empathy, and objectivity. Somehow, I've said all this, and thank you seems really inadequate. But thanks, Mom. This episode is really for you and for all the mothers like you. And yes, I will still send you a card and come visit. I love you, Mom. All right. Are you ready to explore the lived and imagined experiences of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood in early America? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Salem College in North Carolina. Her research focuses on the history of women, gender, and race in early America, and she's the author of several articles and a book, Maternal Bodies, Redefining Motherhood in Early America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Nora Doyle. Hi, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure, Nora. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I wonder if we could begin with an overview of how early American society thought about mothers and motherhood. I know in your book, Maternal Bodies, you spent a fair amount of time exploring both the experiences of motherhood as well as cultural representations of mothers between the 1750s and 1850s. So would you tell us a little bit about what you found? Sure. So the period that I focus on in Maternal Bodies between the 1750s and 1850s is a particularly interesting one for the history of motherhood. This was really the moment when motherhood came to the forefront of Euro-Americans' understanding of what it meant to be a woman. So in the earlier colonial period, Anglo-Americans tended to think about women as being primarily defined by their relationships with their husbands. They were known as helpmates, who played a variety of roles in their husbands' lives. Obviously, childbearing was one of these marital relationships, but parental authority was generally understood to be in the hands of the fathers. So mothers were seen as important predominantly because of their ability to reproduce. As Benjamin Franklin wrote famously in Poor Richard's Almanac, a ship under sail and a big bellied woman are the handsomest two things that can be seen in common. So in essence, it was women's physical ability to bear children that was most important rather than their intellectual and emotional ability to mother. But then in the second half of the 18th century, motherhood started to become more central to definitions of ideal femininity, and women became increasingly defined by their relationships with their children rather than only with their husbands. So at this time, women were not important simply because of their ability to reproduce, but also because of their capacity to mold the minds and morals of their children. 
And scholars have really pointed out that this shift was related to a couple of key trends that were shaping American society in the 18th century, the Enlightenment and the spread of evangelical Protestantism. These two intellectual and religious trends spread from Great Britain to the British colonies. So it was very much a transatlantic phenomenon. Although, of course, very different, both Enlightenment thinkers and evangelical Protestants promoted images of women's natural virtue and tenderness, and both emphasized women's maternal role as her most important contribution to society. Now, mothers were really held responsible for applying their natural virtue and tenderness in order to raise good citizens and good Christians. And then as one last point, this growing emphasis on motherhood as a social role, rather than simply a reproductive one, really granted women a new kind of influence in society. Although they did not gain new legal or political rights at this time, it seems that the growing importance of motherhood afforded women a degree of moral authority, as well as increased access to education, because this was now seen as a way to improve their capacity for child rearing. And this emphasis on motherhood as women's most important role really only intensified in the early decades of the 19th century, which saw an absolute explosion of print culture that particularly highlighted women's maternal role. I'm really curious to know more about when and how the idea that women's physical ability to bear children was more important than her brain. Because this idea is still one that seems to have some staying power in our own day, and I'm just really curious when it developed. So do you have an idea when this idea developed and how it became so long-lasting? Yeah, I mean, this focus on women's fertility on their reproductive bodies, I think, really goes back quite deep, certainly in European societies. So when English migrants were coming to the British American colonies, they were bringing with them this pretty long-standing tradition of emphasizing women's sort of role in terms of reproducing the family and society, and women's legal status sort of reinforced that. So women, in a legal sense, really belonged to their husbands and were subsumed into their husband's sort of identity. And so they didn't necessarily have a clear legal or social role separate from him, in a sense. Okay, but do we know when the idea that women shouldn't be separate from their husbands developed? Oh, that would be hard to pin down, I think, for me. I mean, we could certainly go back looking at specific legal traditions, potentially in different European nations, particularly. But I think that idea certainly goes all the way back to perhaps biblical traditions that very much shaped, of course, English and Anglo-American society. So thinking about Adam and Eve as sort of the founding tradition and thinking about her relationship and the way that her reproductive capacity is portrayed in the Bible, that would be one way I think of sort of taking that back pretty far in time. Now, thinking about women's fertility and their ability to reproduce, what was pregnancy like in early America? I mean, what kind of pregnancy and experience could an early American woman expect during the mid to late 18th century? And how would her experience have changed by the mid to late 19th century? So I argue in maternal bodies that many, if not most, women regarded impending motherhood with ambivalence. And this was because of the physical challenges of pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding. So many women looked forward to becoming mothers. They cherished their children, and they often reaped the social rewards of motherhood. But they also viewed childbearing with fear. Childbearing was hard work, and many women were already doing what we would think of as hard physical labor, whether that was for their own families, or for wages, or because of enslavement. Moreover, women understood that every pregnancy could bring pain, temporary or even permanent debility, and perhaps death. So in my research, I was particularly struck by the writings of a woman named Sarah Logan Fisher. And she was a Philadelphia Quaker who kept a really remarkable diary for about 20 years until her death. She experienced at least eight pregnancies. And with each one, she seemed happy at the prospect of another child yet simultaneously terrified by the suffering and danger she faced. Although she was comfortably middle class, she'd worked hard in her household. She was often out walking around town, running errands or visiting friends. And during her pregnancies, she complained frequently of fatigue and heaviness. 
She also recorded a number of deaths of female friends and family in childbirth, which made her particularly apprehensive for her own safety. So the fear and ambivalence that Sarah Logan Fisher articulated was common, and it really persisted throughout the period that I focus on. So this means that there was a very interesting continuity in women's attitudes in spite of a couple of key changes that were occurring throughout this period. The first change was really in the average fertility rate, which gradually began to decline in the late 18th century from a high of more than seven children per woman and then continued to decline steadily throughout the 19th century, in fact, declining by about half by 1900. But in spite of this decline, women were still enduring a number of pregnancies, miscarriages, and deliveries. So their attitude toward motherhood was still colored by fear of these complicated experiences. Moreover, this decline in fertility was experienced very unevenly. So middle-class urban women were often more likely to have smaller families, while many rural women, as well as immigrant women, continued to bear large families. And enslaved women's fertility rate actually increased in the 18th century, and in most areas remained high until emancipation. Then the second key change that was happening during this period was in medical practice. So midwifery, or obstetrics, as we would call it now, began to be incorporated into the male medical profession in the second half of the 18th century which meant that a gradually increasing number of women were delivered in their homes by physicians. So in spite of this development in medical practice, the period that I focus on did not actually see significant improvements either in maternal mortality rates or in pain management. And in fact, male physicians may actually have increased maternal mortality rates in some cases during this period. So even though some women began to experience new medical practices and new technologies, they still viewed childbearing as painful and dangerous. And this perspective colored their overall view of motherhood. And then finally, I think the question of control is particularly important to think about in terms of understanding women's attitudes and experiences. So the declining fertility rate meant that some women, at least, were gaining a bit more control over their fertility. And that was probably through a combination of efforts such as abstinence, prolonged breastfeeding, and perhaps use of the withdrawal method. But their ability to control their fertility generally depended on the cooperation of their husbands, or in the case of enslaved women, on the involvement of their owners in their sexual and reproductive lives. So today we often talk about choice in the context of reproduction, but most women of European or African descent in this period did not have a choice when it came to pregnancy. Wives could not legally deny their husbands sexual access and enslaved women had very limited control over their sexuality and fertility. So the best that most women could do was to find ways to space pregnancies a little farther apart, or to try to cease childbearing a little bit sooner than the onset of menopause in order to thus limit their overall fertility. So some women did this very successfully, but many did not. And so I think it's important to imagine how this lack of control really colored their attitudes toward motherhood. It also seems like mortality would have also played a role in women's fear and lack of control or the sense that they lack control. And Leslie wonders how early American childbirth mortality rates really fared and compared with those of 18th and 19th century Europe. So could you draw this comparison for us? That's a great question, and it's very hard to answer because mortality rates were extremely hard to pin down. One big reason for that is simply that records are very, very incomplete for the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the other problems with trying to estimate maternal mortality is that women's deaths often were not correctly related in the records to childbirth. So, for example, a woman who developed an infection as a result of her childbirth, but perhaps she didn't die until several weeks later, that death might not have been labeled as related to childbirth. So all of that is to simply say that it's very hard to pin down solid numbers. And maternal mortality rates tended to vary a lot by specific localities and by specific practitioners as well. So in general, scholars who've looked at mortality rates have tended to look at very, very specific locations, whether that's in North America or elsewhere. So it's hard to get kind of a broader regional or even national estimate 
one estimate that I have seen for the American colonies in the 18th century is somewhere between six to 20 deaths per 1,000 births. But that, of course, that's a fairly broad, a fairly imprecise estimate. And one thing to also think about in terms of maternal mortality is that it really did not start to decline dramatically until the development of sterilization techniques and antibiotics in the early to mid 20th century. So there's quite a history of sort of continuity there in terms of very high mortality rates, both in Europe and in what would become the United States. So we don't start to see women's experiences and their attitudes really change in terms of that overall fear of mortality. And it seems like another challenge in trying to calculate mortality rates would have been the fact that historical records only provide so much information and that churches, archives, and municipalities only collected information about certain kinds of people. So it would be really hard to calculate an accurate number because we may never know what the childbirth mortality rates of Native Americans, enslaved, the poor, or other groups of people was. Yes, those records are also very much incomplete. So we have, I think in general, scholars have done a little bit better recording infant mortality rates and sort of studying those numbers among enslaved populations, for example. But yeah, looking at maternal mortality rates among enslaved women, for instance, we would expect them to be equally high as other women in North America, but also potentially higher because of concerns like malnutrition, because of perhaps more exposure to illnesses like malaria in the South, for instance, and because of forced labor as well. Those could have contributed to greater complications and potentially greater mortality. But the bottom line for all women was simply that medical technology was not yet particularly good. (laughs) And so any woman, regardless of her class status, regardless of her overall health and well-being, any woman could suffer a fatal infection or a fatal hemorrhage very easily. Now, one really interesting section in Nora's book, Maternal Bodies, charts how childbirth and pregnancy went from being the province of women during the 17th century to a field of medical practice by men by the mid to late 18th century. So Nora, why did this shift happen? Why did early American women all of a sudden want to include men in the process of pregnancy and childbirth? And what role did men play in pregnancy and childbirth? Right. This is a really fascinating piece of history. So prior to the mid-18th century, midwifery was almost exclusively in the hands of women. So physicians would have been called in only for pretty extreme complications. But then in the mid-18th century, a new trend started in Great Britain as a few physicians began to develop expertise in midwifery. So they believed that physicians' knowledge of internal anatomy, which they gained through the process of dissection, made them better equipped than female midwives who lacked this kind of formal medical training. So this is the time when we start to see a number of midwifery textbooks being published by physicians. And we also start to see medical schools in places such as London and Edinburgh, also Paris, if you want to think about continental Europe. But we start to see these medical schools teach obstetrics in a systematic way for the first time. William Shippen was a physician who returned to Philadelphia in 1762 from getting training in Great Britain, and he began to teach the first really comprehensive program in obstetrics in the British American colonies. Now, some scholars have portrayed physicians as kind of aggressively pushing their way into obstetrics as a way of expanding their reach while challenging the medical authority of female practitioners But other scholars have really argued that women themselves actually helped drive the professionalization of obstetrics because they hoped that the formal training and the instruments and the pharmaceuticals that physicians used would ultimately create better outcomes for them in terms of pain and mortality. Forceps, for instance, were generally only used by male practitioners, and women saw them as a potentially life-saving technology. So at first, elite women were really at the forefront of asking for these new medical options, and then their demands eventually shaped medical practice for everyone else. But it's important to note that in this time period, the professionalization of midwifery was definitely not without controversy. So both practitioners and patients 
were deeply concerned with questions of modesty and sexual propriety. So was it dangerous and immoral to allow a physician access to women's intimate parts? Those physicians who did advocate for professional obstetrics knew that they needed to tread very carefully, and they looked for ways to practice midwifery while still maintaining a respect for propriety. So men really had the tech that women thought might alleviate some of their fear during what really must have been a trying and harrowing time of their life. Essentially, yeah. So, I mean, their technology was quite limited compared to what we're used to today. So the forceps, that was a major innovation in obstetrics practice. Physicians also might be able to use laudanum, other types of opiates for sort of limited pain management. Physicians also frequently bled their patients, which they believed was the way of treating sort of a whole host of complications. So women thought that these new practices and technologies would be beneficial. Unfortunately, the reality was is that most of these technologies did not, in fact, improve outcomes overall and may have actually caused considerable problems. So, for example, if you are deploying forceps, you are dramatically increasing the risk of infection, whereas a female midwife who would not have used forceps probably would have had less contact with the laboring woman's body and therefore would have created less risk for infection or for injury or hemorrhage by using those kinds of instruments. Okay, so now that we've explored childbirth in early America, we should really explore the experiences of motherhood in early America, which is what we'll do right after we take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this episode. I think it's pretty clear from our conversation with Nora that pregnant mothers and mothers-to-be needed support. And it seems like they did have some support from their friends and family members, as well as from their midwives and doctors. Which is great, because the support we give and receive from each other is something that has proved vital throughout human civilization. And I know this is something that we've seen time and time again as we've explored the early American past. We've seen people band together to create town cities and churches. We've seen like-minded individuals come together to foment, resist, and wage revolutions. Community support is key to nearly everything we do as humans. In fact, it's crucial to this podcast. This podcast is possible because of the support we give each other. The Omohundro Institute and I help you explore the early American past through great historical scholarship. And in turn, we rely on you to listen to episodes and to help us spread the word about the show and all its ideas. And now, you can help us spread the word even further and show the world that you're a part of the Ben Franklin's World community because we have t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies in our new Ben Franklin's World store. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop, and you'll find a couple of great designs. And each item you purchase will raise some funds to help the Omohundro Institute and I keep this podcast going. Now, I know you've been asking me to set up a place where you could buy some Ben Franklin's World swag, and I know this store is still quite new. So if you have ideas about other goods that you'd like to see in this store, just let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com, and the Omohundro Institute and I will do our best to stock the items that you want to display your Ben Franklin's World pride. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop and order your new Ben Franklin's World t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies today. Now, Nora, one of your goals for maternal bodies was to show that there was a gulf between the lived experiences of motherhood and cultural representations of motherhood in early America. So would you tell us how you went about exploring these ideas and issues? How exactly were you able to research the lived experiences of early American mothers and the different ideas early Americans had about motherhood? Yeah, so broadly speaking, I looked at two main categories of sources. In order to get at women's lived experiences, I used what I would describe as personal sources. So things such as letters, diaries, published slave narratives and memoirs, and other types of first-person texts. So these types of sources provide historians with a window into individual women's lives and often provide glimpses of the rhythms of daily life, as well as some of these more dramatic moments relating, for example, to childbirth. Then in order to understand how motherhood was viewed more broadly in American culture, I looked at print culture. So this includes texts such as medical books, advice manuals, popular magazines, 
and then visual culture, because in this period, we start to see a very interesting visual culture emerge in America as well. So these kinds of published texts really give us a sense of the ideas and the perceptions that shaped people's worldview. And in particular, I think these kinds of sources can tell us a lot about how very broad concepts such as gender, race, and class really shaped how Americans thought about different issues, and in this case, of course, motherhood. So as you reflect upon those personal sources, what seemed to be the reality of motherhood in early America? I mean, what kinds of work did women perform as mothers, and did that work ever vary between the 18th and 19th centuries? Also, Tumek would really like to know if early American women had any networks of support to help them with their work as mothers. Right. So one of the points that I really want to make in this book is that we really need to think about motherhood as being work, which I think is something that we often don't take seriously even today. One of the things to keep in mind is that women were typically having babies every 18 to 24 months or so which meant that while they were pregnant, recovering from childbirth, and of course, breastfeeding, they were also usually caring for at least a couple of other young children, not to mention managing their home. So this was really a lot of work. Women were responsible for feeding, clothing, healing, entertaining, and of course, educating their children, alongside the other tasks that they had to do depending on their socioeconomic status. So I would say the basic responsibilities of mothering remained relatively constant over the period I focus on. But the late 18th century saw the beginning of a new emphasis on women's moral and emotional work as mothers. As more American families lived in towns and cities where they could purchase ready-made goods, some women shifted from being producers to being consumers which meant that they spent less time making products for household consumption. And this in turn allowed them to focus more intensively on mothering and expectations increased for women's involvement in their children's lives. So this was sort of one of the changes that we see during this broad time period that I'm looking at. But in general, across this time period, many women really managed the demands of motherhood with quite a bit of help from other women. So older daughters and unmarried sisters provided important assistance to women. And sometimes they even took over most of the work of mothering or housekeeping during times of illness or childbearing. Women also tended to enjoy quite a bit of assistance immediately after giving birth. So traditionally, women who did not need to work outside of the home could spend as much as several weeks in bed following a birth, while other women assisted with childcare and running the household. So the processes of childbearing and child rearing really forged strong connections among female friends and kin and provided a sense of continuity between generations as older women had opportunities to help new mothers adjust to the physical, intellectual, and emotional demands of mothering. I wonder whether women's reliance on kin and other women to help them right after childbirth or, you know, during periods of illness varied between those who lived in cities and those who lived in more rural or frontier areas. And I'm thinking about this because roads, you know, if we can call them roads in early America, roads were really difficult to travel upon. So I wonder if family aid was something that rural and frontier women could even count on, you know, or if they would have had to make do with less assistance. Yes. So location was definitely important in determining sort of the resources that women could access. So you're right that in very isolated areas, women might not have had access to extensive female kin, in which case they would have relied perhaps on those older daughters who, as they grew up, could participate more and more in sort of assisting their mothers. Women were somewhat mobile in this period, although that mobility, of course, was very much constrained by socioeconomic status. So certainly when you look at women's letters to their sisters and their mothers, for example, oftentimes you see them discussing sort of an impending delivery and oftentimes discussing when that relative may be able to come and stay and sort of wait for that event to happen. So women who had some resources, some mobility could basically maintain those networks from afar and then bring together some of those particularly important women 
mothers were often sort of the primary figure women really liked and wanted to have their mothers with them when they were delivering. But in other cases, women may have had to have the assistance of their husbands or basically anyone who is in the household with them. Now, in maternal bodies, you discuss the different responsibilities that mothers had. And you noted that one of the responsibilities was that they were in charge of feeding the children. And today we know that there is a debate over whether mothers should breastfeed their babies or whether they should feed them with formula. Was there a similar debate in early America? Stessa would really like to know whether early American mothers used formula and wet nurses as methods to feed their babies. Yes. So breastfeeding was a very common topic of discussion in this period. So beginning in the mid 18th century, we start to see a lot of sources emphasizing the importance of maternal breastfeeding as opposed to wet nursing. The very interesting things is that there was a significant shift in the late 18th century in terms of how advice writers promoted breastfeeding. So writers earlier in the 18th century tended to argue that maternal breastfeeding would promote infant and maternal health. So a very pragmatic argument. But later in the century, advice authors started to emphasize pleasure. And they advised women to breastfeed their children because it would be their greatest source of emotional and physical pleasure. Now, the reality was that women didn't have very many good options for feeding their children. So if a mother died, or if for some reason she couldn't or wouldn't breastfeed, there were essentially two options, neither of which was ideal. They could hire a wet nurse, or they could hand feed the infant. Hand feeding was really not a great choice. Infant formula wasn't developed until the late 19th century, so hand-fed babies were typically given mixtures that could include things like broth, animal milk, flour, water, sugar. These mixtures, as you can imagine, would not have been very nutritious. And in addition, the vessels and the mixtures were often full of bacteria. At this time, of course, people didn't know to sterilize the containers, and they didn't have refrigerators to keep things like milk from spoiling. So hand-fed babies were less likely to survive. Now, families could also bring wet nurses into their homes or send their infants to live with wet nurses until they were weaned. And if you look at early American newspapers, there are hundreds and hundreds of advertisements from families looking for wet nurses and from wet nurses looking for employment. So it's really hard to pin down exactly what percentage of American families actually used wet nurses, whether those were hired or enslaved wet nurses. But most scholars think that American women generally planned to breastfeed their own children and only sought wet nurses for brief periods, perhaps when they were recovering from childbirth, or for longer periods in the case of complications with breastfeeding, or of course, in the case of maternal death. And then by the mid-19th century in particular, there seemed to be a growing stigma against wet nurses. And so this started to be seen a bit more as a last resort. So now that we have some idea of what the lived experiences of motherhood were like between the 18th and 19th centuries, what were some of the imagined experiences or expectations of motherhood that you found while researching these periods? Yes, so the imaginary world of motherhood is very interesting. Whereas childbearing women tended to emphasize the physical work of motherhood, especially in the context of pregnancy, childbirth, and of course, breastfeeding, the trend in American print culture was to imagine motherhood as a primarily emotional and spiritual role, totally disconnected from the work of the body. So essentially, what I argue in maternal bodies is that between the late 18th and early 19th centuries, American print culture gradually reimagined the mother as a disembodied figure whose importance lay in her emotional and moral influence rather than in any of the wide range of physical work that she did as a mother. So I refer to this disembodied image of motherhood as the sentimental mother. And this cultural phenomenon was really connected to a broader sentimental culture that emerged in the mid to late 18th century and privileged feeling as both an expression of and a path toward virtue. Whereas emotions had often been portrayed as irrational and dangerous and unruly, sentimentalism really recast feeling as an essentially positive force that would draw people together 
and foster understanding and compassion. So sentimental culture tended to highlight women as being especially susceptible to feelings, such as tenderness and sympathy. And therefore, women were deemed especially virtuous and therefore uniquely suited to child rearing. So the ideal of the sentimental mother emerged in different ways in different types of print culture during the period that I focus on. For instance, in the second half of the 18th century, medical literature began to portray pregnancy and childbirth as processes that were separate from the mother herself. So I argue that medical writers made the uterus what you could call the main character in their medical narratives, allowing the figure of the ideal mother to become dissociated from her body. Then, once the mother was separated from the physical messiness of maternity, her emotional and spiritual qualities could be emphasized. So in the early decades of the 19th century, popular women's magazines started to emerge, and they portrayed the ideal mother as a spirit or an ethereal influence, which was a word that was used a lot in connection with motherhood. And poetry was a particularly popular literary form in these magazines, and poets often portrayed mothers as nothing but a memory or a voice from beyond the grave. And in fact, this popular literature seemed to suggest that the sentimental mother's influence actually grew stronger as her body weakened and disappeared. So you can imagine that at a time when maternal mortality was a very real concern, these images of the sentimental mother as an everlasting influence must have been very comforting and potentially inspiring for female readers. At the same time, though, I think it's really important that we confront the ways that this disembodiment of the ideal mother posed significant problems for lower class and non-white women. So American society defined these women by the labor of their bodies. Therefore, because the sentimental mother was defined by her separation from physical labor, this meant that lower class and non-white women could not really enjoy the same kind of moral authority and privilege conveyed by the culture of sentimental motherhood. Do we know whether women created this idea of the sentimental mother and divorced themselves from their bodies or whether they contributed to the ideas of sentimental motherhood or was this purely the construction of men? They absolutely contributed to it. So certainly in the 18th century, most authors in general were men. But as you get into kind of the late 18th century and into the 19th century, you see more women in general becoming writers, being able to publish their writings. And you start to see women in particular really engaging in this sentimental literary culture. So if you look at popular women's magazines or also gift books, a type of volume that sort of compiled a lot of popular poetry and images, things like that. If you look at this kind of popular print culture, you can see that women are very frequent and increasingly frequent contributors. Now, they didn't always publish under their full names. So you see a lot of sentimental poems, for example, that are simply marked with someone's initials. So we don't always know exactly who wrote some of these texts, but certainly women were very much engaged with these ideas and these representations. So how did all these changing notions about the realities and expectations of motherhood impact the understandings of early American girls about what it would mean to be pregnant and have children? That's a great question. So it's hard for us to find the sources, the kinds of consistent letters or diaries that would really allow us to trace someone from a young age sort of through their actual experience of motherhood. But I think that women in general, so young women perhaps anticipating becoming mothers for the first time and women who are already mothers, they were very much aware of and engaged in this sentimental culture of motherhood. For example, you see women copying poems that they have read into their letters, into their diaries, into albums that they would keep for that purpose. People in this period read aloud to each other. That was an important form of entertainment, particularly for middle class and elite Americans. So women of sort of in all stages of life would have been very much engaged in sort of sharing these kinds of ideas. 
And when women talk about their reactions, they tend to see these ideas as very beautiful and very inspiring. But at the same time, that doesn't seem to stop women from really acknowledging the parts of motherhood that they find really hard and really scary. So for instance, a source that always comes to mind is a young woman who was anticipating becoming a mother for the first time. And she wrote to a sister who had already born children, basically asking her, how bad is the pain of childbirth? So even though she was very much steeped in some of these sentimental ideas about the emotional rewards and sort of the beauties of maternal tenderness, she was also always coming back to those physical challenges and sort of dwelling on those issues and really framing her understanding in terms of that physical experience. When you were telling us about the idea of the sentimental mother, you noted how poor white women and free and enslaved African and African-American women just didn't fit into this notion. So would you tell us how this idea impacted their experiences with pregnancy and childbirth, especially since so much of white society seems to be buying into it? So the case of enslaved women, I think, is particularly interesting and instructive for us to look at. So at the same time that we see popular feminine print culture emerging in the early decades of the 19th century, we also see the rise of anti-slavery print culture. So sort of two parallel phenomena. So things like magazines, pamphlets, and almanacs would include essays and letters and stories and poems and images and all kinds of things that were all designed to inform readers about the horrors of slavery and, of course, ideally convince them to take action. And what's interesting is that both mainstream feminine print culture and anti-slavery print culture really put motherhood at the center of their representations of womanhood. So to a large extent, this anti-slavery print culture drew on some of the same kinds of sentimental language and imagery that was being popularized in mainstream print culture. For instance, there were countless poems featuring the enslaved mother as a sentimental figure who was defined by the same kinds of emotions, such as tenderness and sympathy, that were highlighted in depictions of white mothers. And this use of sentimentalism was very purposeful. Anti-slavery writers really sought to forge an emotional connection with a predominantly white middle-class audience. Motherhood was portrayed as a shared emotional experience that could really strengthen that connection. That being said, though, there were some crucial differences between images of white sentimental motherhood and enslaved mothers. So whereas mainstream print culture worked to erase the body of the sentimental white mother, anti-slavery texts emphasized the enslaved mother's body. In essence, the image of the enslaved mother's body, and especially the physical abuse that she endured, became a way of explaining to readers and viewers the need to destroy the slave system. So depictions of enslaved women's bodies were meant to be shocking and to make people outraged enough that they would take action. But by defining enslaved women in terms of their bodies, this print culture also effectively shut enslaved women out of the realm of the ideal sentimental mother. So the slave mother that was imagined in these texts might share the same emotions as a free white mother. But anti-slavery print culture never allowed her to transcend her body and assume the same kind of moral and spiritual power that was attributed to white mothers in popular print culture. So when you look back on all of your research, what do you think the legacies of these early American views and portrayals of pregnancy and motherhood are? And do you think they've had any impact on our own present day? That's a big question. I think we see a lot of these same ideas with us in the present day, particularly if we really focus on the maternal body. As an example, if you look at visual depictions of mothers today, so whether you, maybe you do a Google image search of motherhood, or maybe you sort of scan the covers of magazines in the aisles at the grocery store, we see a lot of images of mothers that tend to be portrayed very consistently. They are almost always young. They are almost always white or light-skinned. They are almost always healthy and able-bodied, conventionally attractive. 
And they tend to have with them the trappings of middle class status. And so essentially the messages that we get in American culture today are that the ideal mother looks and is a certain way. And I think the roots of some of those attitudes and some of those perceptions are very much in this period that I'm focusing on in my work, so the late 18th, early 19th century, where we start to see depictions of motherhood being very increasingly clearly defined along lines of race and class. Now we should visit the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if women had been the chief authors of early American medical texts, parenting manuals, and other popular print materials representing mothers and motherhood? How do you think early American mothers might have been portrayed differently? So this is a tough question. Now, women did write some midwifery textbooks, and women definitely started to write more of the maternal advice manuals beginning in the 19th century. But it's true that particularly in the 18th century, most of these authors tended to be men. So thinking about medical literature, I think that if women had remained in charge of obstetrical practice, I think we would see them privilege medical learning through experience in their textbooks, as opposed to the emphasis on formal anatomical knowledge, which was really the hallmark of the medical books written by the so-called man midwives starting in the mid-18th century. So that, I think, would be one key difference. Thinking more about the realm of maternal advice literature, I'm not actually sure that women writers, if they had been in the majority, would have portrayed motherhood in strikingly different ways. In a sense, most women didn't really need ruthlessly practical advice books because most women had close female networks to help them. So they could get that kind of really specific advice simply by asking either in person or via letters with female friends and relations. So I think in general that advice manuals were actually more important for their ideological work than for their practical advice. So even though the highly idealized depictions of motherhood in advice manuals did not really represent the actual challenges of motherhood, they were really important because they offered a context for elevating motherhood to greater importance in American society. And I think women authors would still have been invested in this ideological framework because by idealizing motherhood, they really created a space for some women, at least, to claim greater authority within the family and society. So even though a lot of this print culture really didn't reflect or represent the realities of women's lives as mothers, they still provided really a framework for thinking about motherhood that I think a lot of women found important and useful. So Nora, do you have a new research project? Since I just recently wrapped up this book project, I'm in the exciting position of now looking around for a new project. One of the areas I've been thinking about a lot lately is the history of motherhood in the early colonial period, so really the 17th century and the early 18th century. A lot of scholars, and myself included, really portray the second half of the 18th century as a key moment of change in ideas about motherhood. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not convinced that we actually know enough about conceptions of motherhood before that time to really pin down the importance of that transition. So that, I think, would be a very interesting possibility for a new project. But for the more immediate future, right now I'm working on more of an article-length project that emerged out of maternal bodies. So the first two chapters of maternal bodies look at pregnancy and childbirth from different perspectives. But one issue that I wasn't really able to focus on as much as I wanted to in my analysis is the concept of pain. 
So right now I'm looking at how childbearing women and physicians conceptualize childbirth pain, mainly in the era before obstetric anesthesia, which is really kind of the moment when we start to see a lot more kind of self-conscious discussion of pain, particularly among medical professionals. I love the phase of project discovery, and we certainly wish you the best of luck with it. Now, if we have more questions about pregnancy and childhood in early America, is there a better way than others to contact you? Yes, I'd certainly be happy to correspond with anyone who has questions. My contact information can be found easily on my faculty page on the Salem College website, which is simply salem.edu. And then I've also written a couple of blog posts based on the research for this book. And those posts can be found at the University of North Carolina Press blog. So anyone who's interested in following up could get a few more details there as well. Nora Doyle, thank you so much for joining us and for helping us better understand the differences between the realities and perceptions of pregnancy and motherhood in early America. Thank you very much. This is fun. When we look up images of motherhood today, we see mothers portrayed as young, white or light skinned, healthy, conventionally attractive, and middle class women. They're images that tell us that the ideal mother should look and act a certain way. Now, to really understand why that is, we need to understand the early American past. Because, as Nora related, these ideas have a direct line of origin right from the late 18th and early 19th century notion of sentimental motherhood. Sentimental motherhood was that idealized representation of mothers and motherhood in early American popular literature and print culture. It was the idea that mothers were exceptionally tender and sympathetic women, and that they were women with power, and that it was believed that women had great emotional and moral influence over their children. Now, it was this emotional and moral power that popular culture sought to portray and champion during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. But by telling early American society that mothers were white and often from the middle class, that they were women with great moral and emotional abilities and standing, early American literature actually worked to divorce mothers from the reality of motherhood. So let's talk about those realities. As Nora related, mothering was really hard in early America. First, there was the physical and mental discomfort and pain imposed by pregnancy. Being pregnant made many early American women anxious because they really had to wonder, would they and their babies die in childbirth? Plus, while there may have been an increase in the number of medically trained physicians during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there wasn't a whole lot these doctors could actually do for the physical pain of childbirth. Now, as Nora mentioned, it's really impossible for us to know how many early American women died as a result of childbirth. Some scholars say it could have been in the range of 60 to 20 deaths per thousand, but that's still an imprecise estimate. And should a woman survive the physical labor and risks of childbirth? Well, actual mothering proved to be a lot of work too. Mothers were responsible for healing, feeding, clothing, entertaining, and educating their children on top of all the tasks that they had to do around their homes and to support their families. And just like today, the work mothers had to do often varied along socioeconomic lines. Those with money could afford to heal and stay in bed a bit longer after childbirth because they could afford to bring in female relatives from out of town and hire wet nurses to help them. They may have also been able to afford to hire or purchase domestic labor so that they could really focus on mothering. But poor and enslaved mothers often had to mother, perform labor around their own homes, plus perform labor outside of their homes, all to support their families. So the answer to our questions really seems to be that motherhood has always required a lot of time, energy, and labor on the part of women. Yes, the context of that labor has changed some, and the tools and medical care most mothers have access to has changed too. But mothers still perform a lot of work. And this is something we should recognize. Look for more information about Nora, her book, Maternal Bodies, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 237. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our awesome theme music. Finally. What do you think of the idea of the sentimental mother and how we use it today? Do you think that we can or should portray and think about mothers differently? I'm curious what you think. So drop me a line, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.